Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. And today I would like to do something again about matrices. Why? Well, because I just like matrices. So matrices are absolutely great. Um, and in particular, I would like to think of a property of matrices that they usually don't have, uh, computing matrices. So kind of, if you study mathematics or what are some other parts of sciences or whatever, you eventually hit linear algebra, you eventually hit matrices. And you see for the first time that there's an example of a multiplication which is not commutative. So commuting matrices um, then will play usually a very, very crucial role because it's kind of very rare that matrices commute. Um, we'll see what that means. But what I find surprising about this theorem, which is sometimes called Schur's commuting matrix theorem, is that the percentage of commuting matrices, well, we'll be a little bit more precise later, is much bigger than you actually think it is. I mean, or at least I do. So for me, it feels like this is like impossible. This is just really, really difficult. And there are not many matrices that commute, um, but it turns out that it's around 25%, which is a ridiculously large number. Anyway, so let's get going. And um, the proof is actually not so difficult Kind of the idea that this is true is, well, actually part of the proof. Um, the idea that this is true is somehow more surprising and pretty pretty cool idea due to Shure, which was later generalized. So Shure only did it for the classical matrices over some complex numbers or something, but it actually holds, as you will see, uh, for any field. All right, let me try to motivate the question in a very different way. So matrices are graphs. Um, so you can take the adjacency matrix of a graph. We'll see that in a second. But for now, we just have a graph. And I have a red graph and a blue graph. And the only thing they have in common are so the vertices, they, they share the same vertices, but they're different graphs. So uh, my red graph here is really just a circle together with this little uh, loop here. And my blue graph is this slightly uh, set triangle because it misses an edge. An angle, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, so I have a setting here and I have some graphs on the same number of vertices. So I have a red graph that I call X and I have a blue graph that I call Y. And I would like to do the following. So I would like to consider paths in those graphs, kind of alternating between the two. So if I start at one, for example, and I'm allowed to do uh, red and then blue has only one pass. But if I'm allowed to do, so I'm start here. But if I'm allowed to do blue um, and then red. There's again only one pass to two. So let's have another look at another example here. If I'm allowed to do red and then uh, blue, for example, going from one to one, I could, could do um, red and blue in the other way around, blue and red in the other way around, there will be only one pass because I need to take this edge and I need to go back. So in this example, those two graphs satisfy a very rare property uh, namely, the red then blue pass are the same as the number as the blue then red pass, kind of with ending on the vertices, right? The pass from one, two to three is so from one to three, the red blue pass is the same as the number of uh, blue red pass. Okay, and kind of what is the maximal k? So k is the number of graphs. I only have two here. So k is two in this example. So what is the maximal number of k that this works, this trick works? That's kind of the question I would like to ask. So how many graphs, so a lot of colored graphs, a red graph, a blue graph, a green graph, a purple graph, a pink graph, you know, whatever. How many graphs can I have such that this property still stays true? That seems to be a kind of good question, but it's not totally obvious that um, this actually works out. So what is say a maximum number of graphs? Um, who knows? And to answer this question, essentially what Shur did without really talking about graphs, of course, because it was kind of before the time of graph theory, what Shur did is to formulate this in terms of matrices and you even get a better statement, um, which you can also formulate in terms of graphs, but it's sort of slightly nicer in terms of matrices. All right, so we look at the adjacency matrix of that graph. So for my uh, red graph X, this just means the following, one is connected to two and three. So I put, so I have a one, two, three, one, two, three. So I put here one and here one because I have a connection to two and three. 
two is connected to three and one. So I put a uh, one into three here and three is connected to everything, including itself. So I just fill it up. And similarly for um, the blue one. And we have two matrices, X and Y. And N is my number of vertices. So I have K N by N matrices. So uh, K equals two again above K is two. And we observe, well, observe is just do the calculation. And you would realize that X times Y is Y times X. And this is where my commuting matrices come in. And in terms of paths, this is just because I have the adjacency matrix here which encodes the, the pass. This is just saying exactly what I had on the previous slide, that uh, red then blue pass is the same than blue then red pass. But now we can easily see that something more is true. We can also say this one here, for example, by commutativity, you can just pull Y wherever you want, or even uh, one further. And this one, for example, would be, um, so blue then red then red pass is the same as red, then blue, then red pass, and so on. And Shua asked the question, you know, what is the maximal K such that this happens? So for fixed N, what is the maximal K such that we can have K commuting matrices? Um, usually matrices don't commute, and we'll comment on that later. Uh, so this is actually a good question. And why should they commute? Just think of the graph picture. We could just take two random graphs, the red one and the blue one, uh, going red and then blue shouldn't be the same as going blue and then red. So in general, this is just not going to happen. Um, here it just does, because of course this example was constructed to work, but in general, this is not supposed to happen. So we could ask what is the maximal K such as we can do this. Um, it turns out that this is a slightly bad question because I can always take, if I have a matrix, I can always take just its multiples or something and they would commute. Um, that's a little bit boring. <laughs> so you get infinitely many. So M commutes with 2M, with 3M, with 4M, and so on. That's a bit boring somehow. So we should really think of the linear independence picture. So matrices are just uh, just uh, vectors in a high dimensional vector space. So N squared, and we can just consider them as linear independent. And it just really means that if you have those matrices, you will, will not find a linear combination of them that gives a zero matrix. So it's much better to consider only linear independent, linearly independent matrices. So to reformulate the question, what is the maximal K such that we have K commuting linearly independent matrices? What could it be? Um, it's also clear to me, as I said, essentially no matrix, no matrices should commute. So it's not quite clear to me what the answer is, but sure give, gives this really beautiful answer to this question. It's absolutely straightforward in some sense, it's easy to remember, and I'm going to explain where it comes from. Um, over any field, yeah, over any field, so anything you want, complex numbers, you're a big fan of crazy fields, use your favorite crazy field. Um, and I have n, I have commuting n by n matrices, I can find at most this number here. So n squared over four plus one. Well, n squared over four plus one for n very, very large, as in my little diagram down here, so this is a blue line. The blue line is a bound. And the orange line is just 25%. Yeah. So as n gets very, very large, you can ignore the plus one anyway. And you can ignore that you round down. So this funny symbol here just means rounding down. Um, so you can ignore that as well. And essentially, n squared over 4 is the answer. And they are n squared. We'll just think of a matrix 2 by 2. We have four entries, which would be 4. Uh, for a three by three matrix, you have nine entries. So it's always n squared. So n squared is a maximal number. And we have 25% of them, n squared over four. So the maximal dimension of this whole space of commuting matrices is about 25%. And this is where this 25% uh, comes into the game. And the bound, I show you actually an example where the bound uh, is achieved. So. This, this really happens. There are matrices that make up 25% of all matrices. And I found it a bit counterintuitive. I don't know how you feel about it if you just think about it for a while. Because essentially, take a large N, N is very large, and you pick two matrices randomly, whatever randomly means, um, then the, the chance that those commute is zero. It, it's just zero, right? So it's approximately zero, of course. But no matter what you do here, I mean, you should 
whatever at random means here. And uh, but anyway, so if you if you do this, essentially no matrix matrices will commute. Uh, but you can still find 25% of matrices that will compute, 25% of the whole space. And the point here is that these matrices are very, very, very special. They're far away from random. It's, it's like you're trying to find uh, a needle in a haystack. Uh, maybe there are 1 million needles in the haystack, but it's still, if you grab randomly in the haystack, you won't find them. But in the end, there will be 25% of them, something like that. So the matrices I'm going to show you that satisfy those bounds are really special. And that's the whole point why this is not a contradiction, but it's just counterintuitive. Okay, so how can we make this work? Well, here's a very boring matrix and I just took both of them to be the same because my example is very small. But if you take a matrix of the form zero something, zero, zero, um, and the zeros are all big enough in my setting here, then whatever X is, and I have another one, zero, Y, zero, zero, then this will always commute because they just always give zero. <laughs> uh, this is very strange, this is very boring somehow. They commute in a very boring sense, they always give zero. And you can just count now how many you have, right? So uh, here X is arbitrary and Y is arbitrary. So you have 25%. And yeah, well, that's essentially the proof. Those matrices commute. And you might wonder where the plus one comes from. So 25% is a, is a top fact, is a uh, leading factor here. And depending on whether you can divide your matrix nicely by four, these blocks might have slightly uh, not quite perfect sizes. So you get this rounding down, but let's ignore that. Essentially, this is saying that we have 25% and this plus one is identity matrix that you can always add as well. So plus one here is identity matrix. Anyway, I kind of feel really, I really like the theorem because it's a bit surprising. The solution um, is it's half of the proof that I showed you. The other half is showing uh, that they are not, you can't do better. So this is really an upper bound. I just showed you that it's achieved. You still need to show that you can't do better. But anyway, the solution, kind of those 25% of commuting matrices is just a very silly. So very far away from being random in what sense ever. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and the plus one, I always like this one. The plus one is just identity matrix. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.